from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, good afternoon. I am Carolyn Brown. I direct the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress. Um, and I'm really pleased to welcome you here this afternoon for a presentation by Dr. Reiko Shino uh, entitled Medical Culture in Yuan, China, that's 1206 to 1368, Aspects of Mongol Rule and Neo-Confucian Activism. Uh, before we begin, let me ask you to please uh, turn off your cell phones, if you have them, and other electronic equipment, so that might interfere with our speaker. This event is sponsored by the John W. Kluge Center, which was established in the year 2000 with a very generous donation from John Kluge to establish a venue on Capitol Hill where the world's uh, most mature scholars uh, might gather for informal conversation with um, some of the country's leaders to bring together the world of affairs and the world of ideas, the thinkers and the doers. Um, but we also have, as I think you know, a very, very active program with the most promising rising generations of young fellows um, who over time, I'm sure, will become the senior scholars of the future. So if you stay tuned for about 20 years, you'll see them all come back again in, in uh, different roles. Um, all of our postdoctoral fellows do give uh, public presentations such as today's. In addition, the center does small conferences and seminars. You can find out more about the center if you go to the library's homepage, www.loc.gov. Um, and sign up for email alerts. This afternoon's speaker, uh, Dr. Reiko Shino, is a Kluge Center, a Kluge Fellow, excuse me, at the Kluge Center. Um, and when she's not here, she's Associate Professor in the Department of History at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. Dr. Shino holds an MA in Chinese philosophy from the University of Tokyo and a PhD in history from Stanford University. Um, in addition, she has studied several years in Taiwan. Um, she speaks and reads Japanese, Chinese, English, and even reads some French, um, and is someone who at some point in my career have studied all of the above, except English, for which I'm a native speaker, blessedly. Um, I have great admiration for her linguistic skills because this is not an easy task um, that she's undertaken, just as prelude to doing her research. Um, Dr. Shino has held a range of grants. I won't mention um, all of these, but in addition to her Kluge Fellowship this year, um, this year she also had an Andrew Mellon fel uh, Research Fellowship at the Needham Research Institute at Cambridge University in the UK. Um, her subject, um, medical culture in China, some 900 years ago, might seem to be an arcane one. Um, and I suppose in some respects it is. But I'm going to invite us to think about it in a different way that may make it seem a little less arcane. Um, this may be a stretch, but bear with me a moment. Um, if we think of the fact that this is a period of globalization, uh, the 21st century is, um, then the history of all areas of the world in some way become our own history. Um, and I think over time, it may take another hundred or more years, but over time, what will probably emerge is a history of human beings on planet Earth. Um, and the establishment and, and uh, integration into that of a history of Chinese medicine is one of the small building blocks. Um, so we have today a subject which certainly is of interest in its own right, um, as many human enterprises are, but we can also think of it as a small contribution to the global, the, the growing history of uh, global history on planet Earth. 
Um, with that introduction, please welcome our speaker, Reiko Shino. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? No? Do you hear me okay now? Not really? It's not working? It's working. Okay, okay, then I'll try to use my loud voice. Um, <laughs> okay, um, uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Carolyn. It has been a great pleasure for me to engage in research and writing in the Kluge Center this year. The staff members at the center, in particular, Dr. Caroline Brown, Mary Lee Lecker, uh, Ms. Joanne Kitting, Ms. Yvonne French, Ms. Elizabeth Getting, Ms. Alicia Robertson, have been very kind and professional uh, hosts to us all. And I truly enjoyed meeting so many scholars and students um, you know, with diverse interests at the center and also in events like this. I'm also grateful to Dr. Min Poon, Ms. Kiyoyo Pfeiffer, Mr. A.G. To, Dr. Mari Nakahara, and many other staff members at the Asian Reading Room in this library. They have been excellent in finding all the materials necessary for me to complete this project. Um, during the eight months that I have been here, I worked on the manuscript of my future book, the tentatively titled Medical Culture in Yuan China, 1206 to 1368, Aspects of Mongol Rule and Neo-Confucian Activism, same as today's uh, presentation title. I started the research for this work, uh, this book or dissertation at that time uh, many years ago, and I'm not gonna even tell you how many years ago, just a very long time ago. Um, and at that time, I vaguely knew that I was interested in the history of medicine in the so-called Songyuan China or the middle period China, uh, which uh, in my case was thinking about 10th to 14th century. Uh, but I did not know what, you know, how to focus. I did not know much more than that. So my graduate advisor said to me, why don't you choose one region Look at uh, local, all the local gazetteers from that region and see what they have to say about medicine. Local gazetteers, I uh, wrote down the words here, Difanji, uh, or local records, were compiled all over China since around the 10th century common era until early 20th century. Uh, the purpose was, uh, purpose of compiling the, the gazetteers was to give new administrators from the central government an overview of places under their supervision. These gazetteers were also vehicle to express local prides. So local elites collaborated with the local administrators to compile and uh, print them and then, you know, revise them later on. I chose this city, Ningbo, in South China as a focus of my preliminary st study because it produced uh, the earliest extant gazetteers and it was fairly, you know, fairly well studied by the social and economic historians. Um, you can see this is like south of Shanghai. Um, Shanghai is a very modern city. It only became a big city in the 19th century and Ningbo was really the center of commerce and culture uh, prior to that. So anyway, um, this region produced three local gazetteers in the Song period, which is 960 to 1276, um, and two gazetteers in the Yuan period. And in case of this region, it's 1276 and 1368. And as some of you know, the Yuan period is when Mongols took over China. Um, and when I finished looking at the first three gazetteers, the Song gazetteers uh, for, for this re region, I was a little, and then I started looking at the first gazetteer from the UN period. Um, then I was a little surprised. Um, it was because I saw this like 19 page descriptions of medical schools and the temples attached to these medical schools that I didn't see in the Song gazetteers at all. Um, and these, you know, came with uh, the medical schools, you know, came with uh, 
you know, what they call temples of the three progenitors, uh, you know, praising three progenitors. And I have pictures of three progenitors there. Um, the Confucians have different opinions about whether or not you should have the image of deities or the legendary figures, but, you know, Ming, you know, book, uh, Ming book, just uh, the book compiled after Yuan Dynasty, um, go ahead, went ahead and just drew pictures. So you can see that he was the, you know, he discovered the Yi Jin. That's like the book that records all the, uh, you know, changes in the world. It's, you know, the basic principles of the world he discovered. And then the Shen no, uh, you know, you can see him eating some green onion or something. So like, you know, he, he's the one who started the agriculture and also his, he tested all the herbs so that he learned, you know, and recorded, uh, you know, what's, you know, what, what can help as, a, you know, medicine. And then Huan Di really set up the whole civilization. Now he's wearing very nice clothes, he, you know, so he's, uh, taught people how to write and, you know, act properly and that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, going back to where we are, so, I, you, know, I, you know, I was looking at this, you know, gazetteer for a page and I, you know, I was thinking, so, you know, what, what are they? You know, I, I suddenly see this in the Yuan period. And if you translate the first section, introductory section of this uh, medical school, the circuit medical school, uh, it says, quote, medical school. In the third year of the Jonton era, uh, which is 1262, we received an edict ordering us to establish the schools and build the halls of the three progenitors. The edict ordered that we should annually practice rituals on the third day of the third month and the ninth day of the ninth month. And when you say this month, uh, it's a lunar, according to lunar calendar. And uh, Goman, Jurong, Fenho, Limu, uh, these are other uh, legendary figures, should also be wor worshipped along with the three, uh, three progenitors, end quote. The gathered here then discussed changes in the location of a circuit medical school and cited commemorative writings inscribed on the walls of the building. It also recorded the dimensions of the paddy field harvest of which supported the schools, the sizes of the rooms in the building, the ritual tools, the books that the school owned, um, the title of the instructors affiliated with this institution, the, this entry on circuit medical school was followed by descriptions of prefectural medical schools and temples. So circuit is more than a little like a state, smaller state, you know, in the current you know, uh, U.S. and uh, prefectures are like counties within the state. So not only the you know circuits uh, capital of the circuit had the you know had this school, but also like you know counties in the countries also had medical schools and temples. None of this could be seen in the gazetteers written in the Song period. Further research showed that the second gazetteer of Ningbo, compiled during the Yuan period as well, followed this, the same editorial decision. And so they, you know, I had even more uh, information about medical schools in this uh, region. But, but after the Yuan dynasty, they're, they're still you know, continued compiling um, uh, local gazetteers. But uh, I couldn't find anything, you know, equivalent in the, you know, later period gazetteers. Um, and examination of gazetteers for other regions shows the similar trend. For example, Chang'an Jitu, uh, it's a collection of map of Chang'an city, a uh, traditional city, uh, now presently known as Xi'an. Um, uh, show the city that, you know, in the UN version, so every page you see, you know, how the city might have looked like, you know, in different dynasties. Um, and when you get to the UN page, you find here, this is San Juan Miao, uh, a, a Temple of Three Progenitors. Um, so you can see that this city did have, you know, San Juan Miao, the, the, the whole for the, the three progenitors. But not the ones earlier. The maps of earlier, uh, you know, city did not have anything. Um, I also found about 40 to 50 commemorative inscriptions dedicated to the medical schools and temples in other places in Wenji collection of literary writings. 
From these materials, I learned that a medical school and temple for Sri progenitors were always conceptually coupled together uh, during this time. Um, in some locality, a medical school building had a hole dedicated to the uh, three progen progenitors inside the building. Sometimes, like this uh, Chang'an city, uh, the temple was built and it functioned as a school. So medical school instructors and students gathered at the temple to have all the meetings that they were supposed to have. Uh, the same time I discovered the large number of primary sources in what I would call medical temple school complexes, I also learned that Robert Himes, a uh, you know, prominent Chinese history professor, had discovered that there were a, a lot more elite men entering in medicine than in the Song period. So I began to ask, and it, so this is Song period 960 to 1236, so Robert Himes found that more elite men um, were in the, the medicine, you know, were, took up medicine than in the Song period. So I began to ask why, you know, why is this historical ch change? Why were the medical schools and temples of the three progenitors uh, built during this period? Why do we have so many more biographies of elite doctors uh, from this period? Um, did this institutional cultural change matter to the development of medical theories? So these are the questions that I asked, you know, as I went on the research, and I'd like to address as much as I can in today's talk. Um, to be certain, by the time Mongols entered China, elite had been respecting medical learning and literate f physicians. Thanks to development of printing and the civil service examinations as the primary method of recruiting medical uh, government officials, the number of reading elites, you know, those people who can read quite complex texts, uh, had increased. Many of them read medical texts and wanted to know more about them for practical and theoretical interest. Scholars in the field such as Chen Yupon and Jilian have argued that the UN medical culture was actually just an extension of the Song culture. Um, I think the UN medical you know, culture was very important and in a way uh, the foundation of the UN medical uh, culture, but I argue that Mongols greatly added uh, to the culture of prestige of doctors by giving them privileges um, uh, and by increasing medical related governmental positions. They also unified China, which was divided into two empires uh, until then, helped, uh, and they helped us, and the unification helped the circulation of medical and philosophical ideas. The Yuan Dynasty's frequent communication with uh, Central and West Asia allowed some Iranian drugs and treatments to be brought into China. Moreover, neo-Confucian scholars who felt frustrated by the fa failure of the Son imperial family um, and elite to mount an effective defense against Mongols, so hope in physicians as people uh, being able to deliver real benefits to society, not just empty theories. And these are the points that I'd like to explain here. So first, uh, Mongol role, um, First, I'll talk about Mongol rule and you know, their ro roles as, a, you know, as a, uh, patrons of doctors um, and also the unifier of China, and then I'll talk about the Neo-Confucianism. First, although Mongols as a conquerors have long been depicted as ruthless destroyers of civilizations in the 13th and 14th century world, historians in the past few decades or so have questioned such description um, uh, Mongols are not entirely uh, right. Um, they have argued, for example, if you look at uh, European traveler's records of the region, you don't necessarily find evidence of destruction or of buildings or massacres, even though the traveler was there right after the Mongol conquest of that region. Mongols might have, might, themselves might have spread the rumor of their cru cruelty uh, to fasten the pace of the conquest, but we as historians need to distinguish the rumors and the reality. In this historiographical context, 
uh, Dr. Thomas Alsen, uh, in his Culture and Conquest in Mongol Eurasia, published about a decade ago, said, quote, in the 13th century, the Mongols created a vast transcontinental empire that functioned as a cultural clearinghouse for the old, old world. Under Mongol auspices, various commodities and ideologies were disseminated and displayed. Using primary and secondary sources written in a vast number of languages, Alan show, Alsen showed that Mongol rulers of the Iranian and Chinese cultures share the cultural resources of their realm with one another. The exchange raised, raised from cartography to printing, from agriculture to astronomy, and to, of course, medicine. To be certain, Mongols were generalist uh, when they were still in Mongol plains. They were nomads dispersed in a large, on a large plain, so each person, each family, had to be independent and be able to do whatever the life demanded. They had their own healing tradition, but theirs was not as systematized as uh, Chinese medicine was at that time. However, once they got out of the plane and started their you know, long journey of conquest, they quickly saw the values of doctors and other specialists. They needed specialist support to keep on fighting the wars and maintaining the conquered regions. They need someone to take care of the wounded soldiers, for example. Um, the, the Mongol rulers themselves got sick and had like, stomach ache or something, and they needed doctors that might, you know, with them. Uh, they might also have seen the magical power of those specialists um, and you know, if we can do something, uh, you know, something very uh, visible and find it advantageous to get their support to justify their political power and authority. So if someone else who is wonderful respects me, I look wonderful too, you know. So, the, so that's the kind of, a, you know, political game that, you know, they apparently seem to have had. So... Um, in 1218, Chinggis Khan collaborated with Central Asians, uh, whose land they had just conquered, uh, to send out an order saying that no taxes or duties should be imposed upon doctors, lawyers, scholars, and various kinds of religious practitioners. Um, and I have the original sentence there. And when his sons uh, center China, entered China, he sought for craftsmen, Confucians, Buddhist monks, Taoist monks, physicians, fortune te uh, tellers, um, everywhere he, uh, he went. Eventually, Chinggis Khan's uh, grandson, Kublai Khan, created a medical household, a household headed by a doctor. Uh, medical household gained tax benefits as well as special considerations at the time of lawsuit. Uh, in return for getting some uh, tax benefit, medical households provided um, various kinds of medical service to the community, uh, such as like taking turns, taking care of uh, uh, prisoners, or um, to oversee governmental public uh, pharmacies. Uh, in case of law, uh, you know, legal benefit, if a member of a medical house was sued for malpractice, the superintendent of medical household in the region joined the trial and passed a judgment in collaboration with a county magistrate or who was the head of the, whoever was the head of the region. So, you know, the voice, you know, the perspective of, me, uh, you know, doctors were respected uh, in cases like this. Um, the Mongol rulers also created the Imperial Academy of Medicine, which is the paramount organ that oversaw all the medical affairs in the government, and the, 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 the rank of the leader of this position was quite high. Um, and they were very influential in you know, shaping the policy, medical policy in the, um, in the uh, empire. Their academy spent the tax they collected and spent the tax collected from medical households. So it's like doctors, you know, supporting each other and supporting their leaders. 
Uh, medical uh, Imperial Academy Medicine proposed the revival and expansion of medical schools in 1260. Medical schools in pre-19th century China were, of course, not like the ones now. Um, a doctor was primarily trained either at home or through apprenticeship, so the students in the Yuan period medical schools were supposed to have um, studied medicine prior to the admission to the school, have begun practicing medicine themselves, but still uh, required to meet this instructor once every other week. When they came to uh, the school, they burned the incense, pray to the three progenitors, take tests to prove that they had done homework. Um, so, you know, you had a signed textbook that you should have read, and when you came there, you, you should be able to write about it. Uh, they would then discuss the clinical experience that they had, you know, during that two weeks. Uh, the instructor would record the results of the student's grade and report them to his supervisors every year. The instructor would also submit his own answers to the test questions so that the supervisors will know that you know, he had the right answers when he graded the tests. The text for the te tests were, textbook for the tests were determined by the Imperial Academy of Medicine and the questions were given by the superintendent of medical schools in each region. If the students or instructor proved to be excellent, they could be chosen as a member of the Imperial Academy of Medicine or you know, get, get whatever good available, good positions in the locality at that time. This was a way for the government to standardize medical practice in the empire and a way for physicians to show off their uh, you know, privileged status by you know, attending this kind of activities. Next, I'd like to talk about the Mongol unification of Eurasia. Mongols placed a large part of the Eurasian region under its leadership and unified China. Um, I'm using this uh, historical maps of China uh, to just you know, give you the overview. The Song Dynasty, this one, was established in 960, um, but then the Jurchens in the north attacked them in 1127, and they took away the northern half uh, of, the, of China proper. So now China was split into Jin Dynasty and a Southern Song Dynasty. Those people, you know, the Song people, um, the, some of the imperial members managed to flee to the, the Southern China, built the temporary capital, what they call temporary capital, um, and it's, you know, it was continued running as a dynasty. So when Mongols came over to China, you know, this is how the, you know, how China looked like. It was, it was split into two countries. Uh, Chinggis Khan unified the eight tribes in Mongol Plain in uh, 1206, and they expanded westward first and then southward into uh, China. Their borders eventually reached uh, you know, Eastern Europe, Korea on the east, and then uh, you know, northern border of uh, uh, Vietnam too. Uh, Mongols completed the conquest of North, Northern China, of Jin Dynasty in 1234, and then Southern Zone China in 1276. So I just wanted to have some you know, graphical image about this. So I have listed here the results of frequent interaction between China and other parts of Eurasia, mostly, most importantly, Iran. First, a central and Western political advisor and doctor who was brought to China by Mongols uh, created a hospitals practicing Islamic medicine in the two capitals. Uh, the Mongols had a, you know, cap two capitals, so he built uh, two hospitals. Um, they were for the poor and the lonely, meaning that those who did not have any family to take care of them. Um, and it is quite obvious that um, the idea came from Iran and other Islamic regions as the rulers there built a hospital over many, um, many centuries before the emergence of Mongol empires. The hospitals uh, compiled a medical book called Hui Hui Yaohan, Islamic Pharmacology. 
It's actually, if you look inside, and not all the pages of that book is extant, but if you look inside, you see you know, some uh, Persian and uh, Chinese uh, juxtaposed. And in terms of the content, it's really a uh, mixture of these two medical uh, traditions. Uh, Western Asian drugs, food treatment methods were also imported into China. And one example is this thing called sharbet, um, electrolyte sharbet or syrup, uh, was a good example of drugs from Western Asia popularized in China during the Yuan period. Prepared from the fruit and flower petals with sugar, sharbet was eaten as a concentrate or diluted in water as a drink. Unlike modern, sh modern sherbet in, uh, or sobet in the United States or elsewhere, it was never been frozen, of course, but West Asians and later Indians sometimes cooled it down before drinking if they had means to do that. Analyzing uses of sherbet in 1001 Night, a collection of stories originating from Arabic, Persian, Indian, um, Egyptian and Mesopotamian folk flares. Uh, Maiji Mashinji, a modern historian, have shown that West Asians before 16th century uh, enjoyed this drink in the following five kinds of ways. After banquet or dinner, basically it's a nice sweet dessert. When one is ill and tired, of course you need sugar to you know, boost up your energy. After taking a steam bath at a wedding banquet, and after a long trip of or a triumphant return from a battle. Chinggis Khan brought a syrup maker from West Asia and had him grow plants you know, to prepare for this uh, syrup. This sweet drink, a pearling, became very popular outside of the palace and beyond the circle of Central, Asia, Central and Western Asians in the Yuan capitals. The Guide to Domestic uh, Operations, which is the, uh, you know, sort of a daily advice book for Chinese people, published in the late Yuan, um, listed seven varieties of he shui, the book's translation of Sharbet. I have also found a Chinese doctor complaining about the popularity of the drinks, like people drink this, but you know, this kind of sweet thing is not good for your body. It just creates fire and everything, and you shouldn't be you know, drinking that. But you know, people drink that. Um, and since the time is running out, I don't want to go into too much detail in this toppling method, but it's a method of, you know, you boil lots and lots of beef in a soup and then, you know, make the patient drink a lot until they either has diarrhea or, you know, vomit. You know, it's a way of cleaning up your system. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, prominent uh, UN doctor, Zhu Zhenhan, used it to cure, it, uh, cure the disease that uh, uh, his, uh, you know, his respected uh, uh, teacher had. Um, uh, he, he said that he was, a, you know, he was from Western Asia, or uh, Western regions, uh, which could mean you know, either Central Asia or um, uh, West Asia. Um, but the mo uh, important thing is that he did not use you know, Galenian theory or something you know, that was very popular in West Asian European medical practice at that time, he did not have any linguistic or any other opportunities to learn this uh, you know, theoretical uh, background of medical theories in, in foreign medicine. But you know, he at least used that treatment method um, and you know, he explained it in a Chinese way. Um, and um, so this is a very you know, difficult matter. To, so you know, he thought that this was, he was basically smuggling in uh, foreign treatment and you know, uh, explained it Chinese, um, a Chinese uh, terminology. Um, and Mongol unification of China had even more visible impacts. So you know, China itself, um, the medical theory of the five circulation phases and six seasonal influences, Wu Yun Liu Qi, became popular in northern Song period and elaborated by doctors in North China. Particularly important were theories developed by Liu Wansu, Zhen Zhongzhen, and Li Gao. Um, and I'm not going to bother you explaining all these uh, theories, but um, it was quite uh, uh, you know, complicated and trying to really connect the uh, you know, theories of cosmology 
uh, human body and the knowledge of detail, detailed knowledge of, you know, pharmacology and you know, uh, herbs. And their books were did not circulate in South China until the Mongol conquest. Um, there was this thing, you know, uh, the the border control was quite strict, and some historians call it like, you know, they had an iron curtain, like you know, communist and uh, uh, capitalist countries had in 20th century. So these books did not circulate. The ideas did not come to South until the Mongols, you know, lifted it, lifted the iron curtain and let you know, people come back and forth. Finally, neo-Confucianism. Um, one more factor, and you know, so I'm, I'm trying to show this you know, model of like, you know, significance of Mongol rulers, but also that you know, Mongol rulers alone couldn't do everything, of course. So you know, what are the you know, reasons why local people responded to the you know, Mongols initiative. And uh, you know, I have come to conclude that Neo-Confucianism played an important role in that process. And Neo-Confucian, the definition of Neo-Confucianism is very tough, but I'm adopting the one uh, Peter Ball uh, put in his book on Neo-Confucianism. Neo-Confucians refer to people who identify themselves as participants in the intellectual streams that emerged from the philosophical teachings of the 11th century brothers Chen Yi and Chen Hao. To the doctrine of human morality, human nature, the cosmos developed from that foundation. And to social activities that linked adherence of these uh, views together and allowed them to put their ideas in practice. Um, Chen Yi opposed to a powerful politician at that time in Wang Hanshi advocated for, who advocated for what we would call a big government based on the Confucian classics rights of Joe. Chen Yi left the government after he decided that he can't agree with Wang Anshi and argued that one could reach the way, the most important fulfillment for, uh, for Chinese men, uh, by reading a proper combination of books and acting properly. He placed his philosophical emphasis on self-cultivation uh, in attention to families and local communities, rather than the entire um, you know, empire. Uh, their philosophy was very popular because at that time, uh, uh, civil service examination was becoming so competitive, not everybody could get government pos uh, position. So these literati, very highly you know, literate, literate, needed sort of the meaning of their lives. And Neo Confucianism gave them that you know you don't have to serve in the government to be uh, you know to achieve your way the you know the goal in your life, um, and uh, this northern you know started out in northern Son and became particularly popular in southern Son, um, and uh, partly due to some of the very uh, powerful theoreticians like Zhu Xi. Um, and Zhu Xi's version of uh, Neo Confucianism, oh, I don't have that. Uh, Confucianism, again, was not really spread in North um, until the Iron Curtain lifted, but you know, once that was lifted, then it became very popular all over the country. And you can see the impact of Neo Confucianism on medicine in various ways. But you know, I would like to talk about you know how Neo Confucians represented doctors, and um, also you know represented the uh, uh, medical schools and temples of the three progenitors. Since time is running out, let me make it really quick. Um, these are the Owansu, Li Gao, Zhu, uh, Li Gao. These two are the very famous doctors in the Jin Dynasty. Liu Wansu um, is really represented as a Taoist, usually. Um, he's, um, you know, his biographer has this episode of him, you know, studying really hard, and then some, uh, suddenly someone came, Taoist monks came to them and made him drink. Like, they, they gave him a cup, and the wine just keeps on filling itself without, you know, so he drinks something, and then he looks at the, his cup and the wine is there. So he keeps on drinking, 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 and, until he fell asleep. 
and when he woke up, he knew that he drank uh, a lot of alcohol, but he couldn't find Taoist. But you know, that's how he understood the meaning of the, uh, some medical classics. Um, uh, drinking to achieve revelation is a very uh, common theme in Taoist biography, and you don't really find that in uh, Neo-Confucian uh, text. Um, uh, but when it comes to Li Gao, who is a late Jin doctor, an early UN doctor, it depended on the biographer how they represented him. Yuan Haowen was a poet, and he didn't care that much about Neo-Confucianism. So um, to him, uh, a doctor, of course, should be very effective in curing, med uh, curing uh, diseases, but also to be able to chat with him, to, you know, chat with, you know, very well. And one example I found was that uh, he has some skin disease and he was afraid that it might you know, cause, him, cause him to die. And he saw this, his good friend and very eminent uh, Dr. Li Gao. Um, then you know, this medicine made him so energetic that he had a nocturnal emission one night. And he, scared, he, he, he got scared because uh, you know, losing semen can be considered um, uh, really a bad thing for a man in Chinese uh, uh, concept of body. And he thought that, oh, that's a sign that I might, you know, I might going to really die. And here's this really anxious patient, you know? So, um, but then next morning he saw his doctor, Li Gao, but wasn't, was too embarrassed to talk about nocturnal emission. But then the, the Li Gao knew that was part of the process that, you know, the curing process. So he just said to him, like, so yesterday uh, you had a change of snowy sleep. Why aren't you telling me that? <laughs> he cracked up. I mean, you know, this euphemism was, you know, something, you know, obvious enough to this poet that said that. And he cracked up and said, I'm not going to tell you that. You know, so, so that kind of literary you know, you, you fin the communication, uh, you know, to belong to this, that kind of same class was very important to him. Um, but the same doctor, when Yan Jian, who is like the grandson of Zhu Xi, the most important um, Neo-Confucian leader in South China, it was completely different. Like, he, they, he talks about Li Gao being taken by his friend to a courtesan's house. And the courtesans were just sort of flirting with him, like, you know, touching his clothes and leaning over him. And then, like, Li Gao got so upset. This is not how it's supposed to be. He took off his clothes and burned his clothes. Or um, another example is, like, you know, he didn't even want to drink. His friends forced him to drink, and then he just spit it out. You know, that kind of like a really rigid uh, kind of a person, you know, always do, trying to learn. So, you know, it's his de the depiction of this guy changed quite a bit, you know, uh, by the Neo-Confucian. And I'm not going to talk about Zhu Zhenghan, the UN doctor, but when it comes to that point, it's really, uh, you know, Neo-Confucian means it became part of the medical theory, not just the behavior for the um, uh, doctors. And give me three more minutes so that I can talk about the um, uh, inscriptions. Uh, the, you know, I would like to go back to the inscriptions that you know, got me started with the research. Um, uh, medical schools you know, often had uh, inscriptions like this inscribed on the walls. And this is, has nothing to do with the three projects. I just wanted to show you how um, you know, inscriptions can look like in China. Um, and one inscription was written by Wu Chan, a, a prominent leader of the Confucian movement at that time. And he goes on explaining how Neo -Conf uh, Confucian schools, uh, also established by the uh, UN Mongol rulers, um, and m medical schools are very important. And he goes on from Tan Dynasty up to the present, all locality under heaven built temples to school, at, uh, Confucius at schools in order to publicize the way, uh, progenitor of the way of Confucius. After the Jin and the Song dynasty, when our dynasty was founded, prefectures and counties each built medical schools next to Confucian schools and built temples of three progenitors at the medical school to glorify the medical progenitors of the way of physician. Uh, heaven created millions and billions of people, and among them were sages 
who were far superior to the rest of the people. Heaven ordered the sages to oversee the lives of millions and billions of people, some hundreds and thousands of years after the world opened up. Finally, Fu Xin Shen Nong Huan Di, these three important uh, progenitors of the civilization and medicine, appeared, and they were the three progenitors. Um, and you know, he ends this. Uh, you know, then he goes on explaining the lineage of Confucian sages that follow three progenitors and end with a remark. How could it be casual that our dynasty, meaning Yuan dynasty, built medical schools in the same manner that it built Confucian schools? Note that Wu Chan was not a kind of intellectual who would easily bend to the political power. He declined, declined offers to serve in the Yuan court a few times, even after he accepted one. He left there uh, once he realized that he could not agree with the court about some educational policies. But he agreed with the Mongols and his uh, political advisor that it was good to promote medical learning and support it, um, uh, to support uh, physicians. Uh, so in a way, it became the common ground for the uh, Mongol rulers and the you know, neo-Confucian activists uh, to support medical schools and to support doctors. And that, that was the reasons why medicine became very important. So here, um, I just said uh, what I just, you know, wrote, I just said. Medical schools temples were built as a result of complex interaction between Mongol rule and neo-Confucian activism. A lot of elite men became doctors during this pe uh, period because medicine was politically viable and philosophical satisfying or you know, attractive option. The institutional, cultural, and political change that accompanied Mongol conquest as Mongol conquered China mattered to the development of medical theory in that tre uh, treating methods from Central and Western Asia entered China and also medical theories developed in North came to South China. And the you know, UN medicine, the medicine as developed by Zhu Zhenhan, became the foundation of medical theory, the rest of the Chinese history, uh, including the 21st century. Uh, Chinese medicine is still practiced in mainland China and other parts of East Asia. And Zhu Zhenhan is one of the leading theoreticians um, you know, uh, that they refer to even at this time. Thank you very much. Chinese uh, doctors in the government knew which herbs can uh, act as a poison, uh, which, which were poisonous. And there were edicts saying that, um, you know, you are not supposed to use the, this, you know, these, these hot herbs, so, you know, you get, you know, uh, some severe penalties, uh, you know, if you use this and that. Uh, that. That was there, and that's part of the way the government tried to control medical practice uh, in China. Yeah. Yeah. 
And um, it didn't seem to have an instant effect because I caught it this place yesterday. I said to him, I'm dying and they're causing me. He had time to go home and tell him what to do, go back to the wine cup. But anyway, um, I think the real thing is going to come to a point of view. Well, I can give you the names of the, yeah, I can give you the names of the herbs that they were concerned about. Yes. Toby? I'm curious, um, you said that these temples of the Greek progenitors exist in the Yuan, but not in the Song. Have no. Basically, and there's some research, uh, Chao uh, Yuanli um, has done a research on this. Um, and uh, uh, basically, after the fall of the Yuan Dynasty, uh, scholars became very uncomfortable uh, dedicating the three progenitors as only as, as the founders of civilization, because they're supposed to be greater than that. They're, you know, they're the founders of the entire thing. So, uh, you know, there's a huge debate about whether or not temples of the three progenitors should stay as a part of the medical school. So, and eventually it got split. So medical school continued on. It was never as, you know, prestigious as in Yuan Dynasty. It was more like medical bureau, you know, making sure things are going okay. Um, um, and then that religious function was taken away um, and uh, in the capital, they continued worshiping, uh, having the temples for three progenitors, uh, but more for, for the reasons of civilization. In the countryside, um, you know, it, I think it changed, in, the building changed in many ways. Some of them were uh, said to have turned into Yao Wan. It's like had a more Buddhist connotation and turned into a Buddhist medical temple or something. So, so yeah. So, but but the thing is that the way that merged was, you know, it was uniquely a UN thing. Yeah. I know immediately, and there might be more, uh, is that uh, the, the, the sherbet that they created, like this uh, sherbet maker uh, planted the, you know, some fruit you know, suited for sherbet. And you know, he was in charge of you know, running this whole orchard and you know, uh, taking care of that. So, so um, that has happened, I think. Um, it is very hard to track. I, I, you know, I've seen some articles, uh, you know, some bi biologists tried it doing, but it, it, was, it seems really hard to prove. But, but I think that that has happened a lot, yeah. Any other questions? Did you, did you have any? One is Western medicine and the Chinese medicine. Uh, you know, the Chinese medicine, as I understood right now, in these medical schools are, of course, a little bit different from Chinese and Chinese medicine. But the basic concept, basic understanding, you know, come from this being within, you know, like, uh, ancient period. So, in that sense, it's still you know, a viable application. Um, is it your question? Yeah. Well, sure. I think that it's a bit 
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.